All right, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Shine within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel, and still in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered all sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual life, thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ, our God, are the light of our souls and bodies, and to you we give glory, together with your Father, who is without beginning, and your all-holy good and life-giving spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Boy, I got, good morning. Some, I got some bad glare coming in through the window. All right. So we are at Acts 9.18. Last time uh, we started uh, chapter 9, <clears throat> and this is the, the famous story of Paul's uh, conversion on the road to Damascus when uh, Jesus Christ revealed himself to Paul. And this really changes... I think it's I think it's fair to say it changes world history this this event especially western world history. And so we're kind of at the end of this conversion account and 918. Uh, All right, I'm going to try to share a screen with you now. Mm, let's see this one. All right. There we go. So we're in this uh, second column here. This is the translation we have in the Orthodox Study Bible, the New King James Version. <clears throat> All right, so remember, so Paul has this experience um, that the, the risen Christ uh, appears to him and tells him finally go. Uh, oh, it tells him to, he goes on to uh, Damascus. He's staying at somebody's house on the, on the street called Straight in Damascus, which still exists to this day. Um, and then the Lord appears to Ananias, who otherwise is an unknown figure. Uh, we don't really know anything about him before this point, and we don't really hear from him again after this point. But it's clear that he uh, is some kind of uh, figure in the Christian community that's already established in Damascus. And the Lord appears to Ananias and tells him, uh, and Ananias is incredulous, uh, telling him to go and lay hands on, on Saul, the persecutor. And Ananias has heard of Saul and so uh, says, are you sure that we're talking about the same person, Lord? Um, but he is sure because the Lord says that I, he is a chosen vessel of mine. All right, let's see here. I'm just going to mute everyone just to make sure we don't have any uh, background noise or anything. But if you have a question, please unmute yourself. All right. <clears throat> so that leads us. So Ananias is obedient to the Lord. This strange request, Ananias is obedient. And so he goes in 17. He enters this house on the street called Straight. He lays his hands on him and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then here's where we start today. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales <clears throat> and he received his sight at once. So something like scales uh, it's a, it's a kind of unusual Greek word uh, that, that means kind of to, to peel, to peel away something. Um, and so there was some kind of peel or something was covering his eyes. And then interestingly, same, the same somewhat rare word uh, in Greek, uh, lipis, uh, is actually used also in the book of Tobit, the book of Tobit, which is one of the, it's, it's a book of the Old Testament, uh, according to us, according to the Orthodox, but it was not accepted uh, by the Jews and therefore by the uh, Protestants. But <clears throat> Tobit was actually a, and continues to be a popular book in the Orthodox Church. And um, in one place, this, this character of Tobit uh, also has this kind of white film and scabs uh, on his eyes that were removed. And the same kind of unusual word is used. <clears throat> So Luke is probably aware of this, and that's how he chose this particular word to describe what happened. Uh, but anyway, Paul was struck blind when uh, when the Lord revealed Himself. He goes to Damascus in this house. He's fasting for three days from food and water. 
Now this representative of Christ comes to him, lays hands on him, gives him the Holy Spirit, and these, these scales, something like scales, fall from his eyes. Uh, <clears throat> he, he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So he's baptized immediately. Now we know uh, near this a street called Straight in Damascus uh, flows the river Barada that runs through Damascus. So it's reasonable to assume that that Ananias probably led him down to the river and, and baptized him. <clears throat> now, sometimes we get the question, and because this happened a chapter before also when uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, who was also baptized right away. And so sometimes we get the question, well, why aren't people, uh, adults baptized right away anymore? Uh, for example, right now, uh, you may have heard me mention we have a, a group of, of catechumens or people who are interested in becoming Orthodox. These are adults <clears throat> coming from uh, other Christian denominations usually. Um, and so they usually typically in the Orthodox Church, they go through about a year uh, of, of uh, instruction about the Orthodox Christian faith, of attending services, becoming familiar with it. And then after this time, they're baptized or chrismated. But so people will ask, well, why do they have to do all that? when in the Bible, in cases like this, they were baptized immediately. <clears throat> so I would point to one thing to answer that question. One, you have to remember that at this stage anyway, uh, what's happening is these people, Saul, for example, is already extremely well-versed in the Old Testament, <clears throat> right? So he's already a Jew and Christianity is not something different really than Judaism. It's the fulfillment or extension of Judaism at this point. They don't even see themselves as completely separate groups. So really the only thing that's changed as we're going to see here in a second, when he starts preaching uh, is that he uh, suddenly uh, something clicks, something falls into place. This kind of hermeneutical key, this key to interpreting the Old Testament falls into place, and that's the person of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He understands him as what the Old Testament was pointing to. All of a sudden, some of these um, question marks about what the Old Testament was referring to, some of these ambiguities, all of a sudden, whoop, they're resolved in this kind of epiphany. You see a light bulb going off over his head <clears throat> as he realized that Christ is the answer. We'll talk about this more in a second when he, he's preaching about the Son of God. So, at this point, you know, he, there's really nothing, you know, there is no New Testament writing yet. <clears throat> Not a single thing of what would become the New Testament has been written at this point. So there's really nothing to prevent him from being baptized. <clears throat> the same even with the Ethiopian eunuch. Obviously, he's someone who had been a God-fearer for some time, who had read the scriptures enough to ask very intelligent questions about the scriptures, who made this long trip to Jerusalem. So really, it was this click that took place with the Ethiopian eunuch when Philip revealed the scriptures to him, <clears throat> that aha, this aha moment. And so then he could be baptized. So I think that's, you know, partial explanation why we see people baptized so quickly <clears throat> here, in the, especially in Acts. All right, so 19. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So fasting from food and water three days, and Ananias comes, lays hands on him. His sight comes back. He arose, <clears throat> and he's baptized. Now, let's see. I'm curious what uh, the verb here, arose, in Greek. Epheus apepis anatokimos. Okay, Anastas Evaptisti. So Anastas, Anastasi. So look, Anistame, this is the verb in Greek too. It just means, this, this word just means to stand up, literally. But it becomes, in Christian parlance, the word for Christ's resurrection. He stood up, he, he rose again. And so Luke, in particular, has a tendency to use this verb in a very um, purposeful way because he's symbolizing, so... So Paul, in essence, you know, three days obviously symbolizes <clears throat> the time that Jesus was in the grave. No water for three days. I mean, this is something that uh, is potentially fatal. So you have this sense that, that symbolically Paul is, is dead. <clears throat> Saul, anyway, dies at this point. 
And when Ananias comes as a representative of Christ and fills him with the Holy Spirit, he rises from the dead, so to speak. He dies to the old man that he talks about in his epistles and he becomes a new man. So he receives food, he's strengthened, and he spends some days with the disciples at Damascus. <clears throat> Oh yeah, so something I want to preach out. So this this really concludes the the um, Paul's con conversion or call calling story. <clears throat> and it's interesting if we reflect back on Acts chapter five. Remember, Acts chapter five, uh, they keep hauling the apostles in front of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, and uh, Gamaliel, this respected uh, uh, rabbi, <clears throat> is brought in. Uh, because they're they're debating what are we supposed to do with these guys? They they beat them, they warn them, they don't listen. The the disciples don't listen. The apostles don't listen. Uh, so they bring in Gamaliel. They respect his opinion. And Gamaliel says, if you remember in Acts chapter five, <clears throat> don't do anything. If if it's of God, then anything nothing you do is going to make any difference anyway. And if it's not of God, it's gonna it's gonna peter out, right? Well, Saul, we believe was. Uh, a disciple of Gamaliel, but he takes a different view. There was a different faction, even within the Pharisee party, that were zealots. Uh, they had zeal, and actually, I'm probably going to talk about this on Sunday <clears throat> in the in the sermon. But so so Paul was filled with this religious zeal, um, and so he tries with every ounce of his being, through man's effort to exterminate this movement of Christianity, exactly opposite of what Gamaliel, his teacher, had told him, had said to do. And look what happens. Gamaliel's prophecy, Gamaliel's advice turns out to be exactly right. <laughs> because no matter what they did, and no matter what Saul did, God was in charge of whether this would succeed or fail. And he uses Saul's zeal and turns it to the favor of the Christians. <clears throat> so it's this, uh, this show that the sign that God is the one intervening into history and leading history it doesn't negate human free will, but there's this divine hand guiding history. Um, and then it's also interesting to note that <clears throat> if you look at 2 Maccabees, uh, 2 Maccabees, which is important also, 2 Maccabees, the Maccabees talks about this revolt, let's say around 150 BC, where there's this religious zeal to reclaim Israel from these foreign oppressors, they'll take violent measures if necessary, <clears throat> and there's this one figure, Apollonius, uh, a foreigner who's attempting to uh, steal from the temple treasury. This is related in 2 Maccabees chapter 3, and then it's recounted again in 4 Maccabees. Um, and so there's a, a story there. <clears throat> oh yeah, it says, so he's, he's uh, this figure Apollonius, he's it's some kind of like foreign officer. He's on horseback and he's riding to Jerusalem to plunder the treasury of the temple. Um, and it says in the text that angels, uh, he's met by angels on horseback who appeared from heaven with flashing armor and knocked him to the ground. And so this is seen as God again, intervening um, into history to uh, uh, divert this wicked plan. <clears throat> so there's something similar uh, going on in, in Paul's conversion story. You know, he's, he's going in on probably on some kind of animal like a horse or a donkey into Damascus to wreak havoc. And again, uh, not an angel this time, but the Lord himself, Christ himself appears and knocks him to the ground and diverts his purpose. <clears throat> Well, there's also, this may be getting a little too far afield, but there's also this, um, you know, the story of, of Joseph in Genesis <clears throat> and this, this figure of Aseneth, who was the, um, who was the Pharaoh's wife, right? And so she tries to seduce him. He rejects her, but she ends up turning him in. He, Joseph ends up going to jail based on her false accusations that he seduced her. Um, well, this, but that's all we hear. The story is actually very brief in Genesis, but there's this long history in Judaism of what they call midrash on this. So it's a kind of expansion. It's an oral tradition of what 
what's not said in the text was <laughs> because people were so intrigued by this story of this kind of court intrigue, um, the plot against Joseph. And so this midrash is, uh, develops uh, expanding the story and then, and it's a famous one. And then that uh, Asenath uh, is actually comes to repentance for her um, behavior toward Joseph. She fasts for seven days and prays to be forgiven. Uh, and then this figure appears to her, calls out her name twice, Asenath, Asenath. She asks, who are you? Tell me. And he reveals that I am the chief of the house of the Lord and commander of the host of the most high. So the, an archangel. <clears throat> She's told to get up, uh, wash her face. And then it reassures her. So again, it's this kind of um, the story of this intervention of the Lord uh, into history. <clears throat> and then you have this uh, washing also, like with baptism. So it's interesting to see this because you can see that, you know, when you read the Bible, <clears throat> you start to acquire uh, a biblical mind, a biblical worldview. Uh, you start to see that the Lord acts uh, in, in um, you know, he's, he's free to act however he wants, but there are times that you can see patterns. You know, this is how the Lord thinks. This is how the Lord sees things. This is how the Lord acts in certain situations, typically. Um, and so I think that that's really interesting. And it's why it's so important that we spend this time to, to read the Bible. I'm so happy that uh, you guys join me to read the Bible together, because that's the way that we start to acquire God's way of seeing the world rather than just the world's way of seeing things. All right, so, <clears throat> all right, so now we enter into the next section here. So, 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the son of God. <clears throat> this is what I was referring to. So, one, it's, it's interesting that Paul immediately goes to the synagogue. So, the same synagogues that he had papers from the high priest, to, he, he was intending to go to Damascus and to go to the synagogues and to preach about this so-called Christ. But what he was going to do is root out who these Christians were and drag them back to Damascus and put them on trial. Now, interestingly, he still goes to the synagogues, but he's preaching about the Christ and how he's the son of God. And this, this it's interesting that, uh, that St. Luke uses this phrase, son of God, <clears throat> uh, so in the, the term son of God uh, in the scriptures can refer to several things. It can refer to Israel as a whole, uh, Israel, all the Israelite people as the son of God. We see that a lot. Then it comes to signify the king of Israel as is sometimes called the son of God. And then the latest the development is that this, the future Messiah uh, will be the, is the son of God, <clears throat> right? So you see some of the same confusion. If you think back last chapter to what the, uh, the questions the Ethiopian eunuch had, it was kind of some of the same questions that appear in Isaiah uh, about this identity of the suffering servant. Sometimes it re refers to the suffering servant as, uh, as, uh, or the servant of God as Israel, meaning the whole body of Israel. And sometimes it appears to refer to the single man, the single figure who could be related to the, the Messiah figure. And so here it's interesting that Paul is preaching about the son of God. What we can imagine is that he's making it clear to the people, to the Jews, what the connection is. He's saying, look, if you look here, you guys had just assumed these passages are a little ambiguous. You maybe didn't know what they mean, just like the Ethiopian eunuch had a question. I'm telling you, this figure is Christ. When it's talking about the Son of God, Israel is one thing, but when it talks about this figure, it's the Christ, it's the Messiah who came and who not only was the single figure, but also represented all of Israel. <clears throat> and what's the reaction? 21. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name, meaning the name of Jesus, in Jerusalem, and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? So they knew, somehow they knew through messengers, we, we might suppose, uh, who Saul was, who Saul Paul was. <clears throat> um, and so like Ananias, they're incredulous. Uh, who is this guy? What's going on? 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength, meaning the strength in, in his preaching, strength in, in the word. 
but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So he confounded, or the word, the word there is actually uh, the word uh, to pour together, to mix, so, as, so really to confuse. You could translate it as uh, that he confused the Jews who dwelt in Jerusalem, uh, proving that, um, uh, and there actually the word is bringing together. <clears throat> so m bringing together or marshalling uh, the scriptures. So picking out passages from the Old Testament to show that Jesus is the Christ, but that this was all very confusing to the Jews. You know, there's this persecutor. He's saying, uh, he's bringing these uh, arguments to us, but it's not at all what they expected to hear from him. So they're confused. <clears throat> All right, any... Father, Father, I have I yeah. have two questions or two comments. Yeah. One, first of all, I don't know if anybody else is experiencing this, but I can barely see you. There's oh, yeah. some, some kind of big glare, maybe. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's the it's the divine uh, grace. Father, if you if you maybe turn the blinds uh, uh, the opposite direction, maybe we could see you because you are totally blurred where I'm concerned. Yeah, they they don't they don't do that. They, they, they can't. Sorry. It's just, okay. it's a, That's a tiny it, bit better right there. Yeah. You look quite holy, Father, with the streams of the sun. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask, Father, is I know that you said that you had to have the Holy Spirit and representatives of the church itself. Or I think that's what you said the church in in Saul's baptism okay you 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 uh dropped out there for one second so it, it, say, it sounded like you're asking who's the representative of the church in Paul's baptism uh, I think yes that's my question okay so uh yeah it's Ananias and the, the fathers talk about this quite a bit so Ananias is definitely you know portrayed as a leader uh, some kind of leader uh, in the nation Christian community in Damascus. <clears throat> and so he's authorized directly by the Lord to, um, to baptize Paul, to lay hands on Paul, to give him the Holy Spirit. But the fathers actually talk about this a lot because, um, you know, it's curious why this Ananias figure, <clears throat> what, and the, the conclusion they come to, which makes total sense to me, is that um, especially if you keep in mind some of the tension that we see late, like in Galatians, for example, Paul, uh, Paul is such an exalted figure in the history of Christianity that um, it wouldn't be fitting for if, if Peter, let's say, or one of the 12 had come to do it, it wouldn't be fitting because then it would imply a kind of subservient role when in fact uh, Paul is the equal to Peter. Peter and Paul are the two pillars of the church as Acts tries to make clear. So the fathers say well the Lord used this otherwise kind of unknown figure uh, to mediate the presence of the church, the approval of the church, but also to show that you know to show that to not show up Paul in other words um, because otherwise it, it perhaps would have made Paul look look weak and because of the uniqueness of his situation so it's it, it, it might be seen as like the um, the uh, the the case that what's that uh, saying uh, that com the case the, the exception that proves a rule right so he still is confirmed by the church but it's such an unusual and exceptional case that the Lord himself reveals himself to him and calls him directly. Uh, you know, that doesn't typically happen. That's not the normative way that priests and bishops are called. Um, so that's kind of given this special place by having uh, this other figure who's not as prominent as Peter. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. But I'm, I'm who, who does whom does the Lord Himself call Ananias or Paul or both? Both, well, both. But but talking particularly about the the uniqueness of Paul's call and his conversion, that there's an effort to preserve the uniqueness of this. But still, he needs to still be baptized. He still needs to have someone with a historical 
uh, connection uh, place hands and on. father uh, the footnote says something about Anias uh, becoming the first bishop of Damascus so mm -hmm. I guess that was later but he that must show that he was already much respected yeah in that city yeah so mm -hmm. he's he clearly he represents the the historical function of the church this historical continuity with the incarnate Christ and the community in Jerusalem which is obviously central for Saint Luke but at the same time he doesn't show up uh Paul by being someone like Peter or John <clears throat> all right so let's go on here all right, so improving that Jesus is the Christ. All right, it's 23. <clears throat> now, after many days were passed, and I hear this whole section of, about, about Paul's call and conversion uh, is an extremely, um, let me see if I, actually, I'm going to try to move somewhere else. It's really bad. Um, so it's an extremely complicated, uh, there's a lot of ink spilled about Paul's, um, the timeline, the chronology, because we get pieces from Paul himself in his letters, specifically in Galatians chapter one, which is happens to be the epistle reading for this coming Sunday. Uh, and so a lot of a lot of ink is spilled trying to reconstruct exactly what happened. And in the end, it's just it's too far afield to go into the details. But there is a lot of agreement on the basic structure of what happened. And then there's some uh, gray area if you if you really want to get into details. So um, when he says now after many days were passed, to me, in my opinion, the most likely explanation is that this coincides with the three years that Paul talks about. Uh, so Paul talks about that he went off to Arabia and then he returned to Damascus. And after three years, he finally went to Jerusalem. So now Luke doesn't mention Arabia at all. <laughs> and this identity of Arabia is another huge question. Uh, I kind of have my opinion on that. I, my opinion is that what he's referring to is that he goes to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb <clears throat> in imitation of, of Moses uh, and then comes back to Damascus and continues his missionary work there. And when he talks about three years, it's almost certain that he's the Jewish or even the Greek reckoning of time, which three years would could mean and probably would mean in this case um, not a solid 36 months, but it would mean some part of, let's say 2018, like December, 2018, November, 2018, all of 2019 into January or February, uh, 2020, right? In the Jewish reckoning, that would be three years. <clears throat> so it's a part or a whole of three different years, but it could in practice be 14 months. So anyway, uh, that's what when Luke says here now, after many days were passed, probably it's this period. And he just skips over Paul going to Arabia, wherever this is. <clears throat> he comes back to Damascus and he continues his work there. Now, what does this lead to? Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. <clears throat> so this is kind of a uh, a familiar pattern we're going to see with Paul is that he goes always, he always, he goes first to the Jews. He always starts his preaching to the Jews. They always reject him. And then he goes to the Gentiles. <clears throat> uh, all right. So 30, oh, sorry, 24, but their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the word, the word watch there's uh, uh, paretiro, which means to observe closely. And this is the exact same word we read in the gospel of St. Luke when they were talking about the Pharisees and the scribes watching Jesus. Remember, <clears throat> they're always watching his every move to catch him in something. So it's the same behavior now of the Jews of Damascus towards Saul. They're trying to get him and they're watching the gates. What does that mean, the gates? So, you know, like most ancient cities, it was a walled city. <clears throat> And it would, uh, at night, they would, they would close the gates or they would bring up the drawbridge or, or bar these big solid uh, gates with a big metal or, or wooden beam so that it couldn't be penetrated by an attacking army. <clears throat> um, and then typically uh, you were in for the night and there was a known time, for example, 
right? Or whatever the time, time was in the evening, there would be a known time that the gates would close. And if you were in, you were in. If you were out, you were out. Now, there were exceptions. You know, if there was some kind of emergency or something, permission could be granted to open the gates to let you in or out. But this was unusual and would require special authority because it was a security issue. So, so anyway, they're watching. So the gates of any walled city like Damascus would have been, <clears throat> um, there would be a limited number of ways in and out of the city. And it was, so it would be fairly easy to watch whether he's uh, going in or out. So they're watching the gates day and night to kill him. 25, then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. <clears throat> All right, so we also know that Paul himself in one of his letters to the Corinthians relates this story. Um, so we know that's confirmed to us by the writing of Paul himself. And so it looks like what happened is, um, so the, the walls of an ancient city would, would sometimes be, uh, you know, 20 meters wide 20 meters thick and there would be in other words there would be multiple walls <clears throat> so it'd be a one an outer wall and then kind of an inner wall and what happened was people would actually build their homes in between these walls uh on the outskirts of the city and you could imagine it was probably beneficial for the city to have people living there because it was like a first line of defense. If someone, if an attacking army was trying to penetrate the outer wall, there's actually someone sleeping there who could raise an alarm, right? So uh, it might not be, it's probably not the high rent district. Uh, it's probably the low rent district, you know, to have to deal with the potential of uh, waking up to an invading army. But there were people who had their homes in these outer walls. <clears throat> And so there's a there's actually an old tradition dating from from Roman times, so from the first centuries, <laughs> that uh, it was actually the home of Ananias. That Ananias had a home in the walls of the city of Damascus, and it was through his house where Paul was staying that they and that the so they would be up significantly off the ground and they would have small holes for windows for the people living there and so they actually think that uh, it was Ananias's house this is an old tradition that they lowered him down in a basket so that they would avoid the people watching the closed gates <clears throat> waiting for someone to ask for special permission to leave perhaps make sense everyone with me all right 26, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, so he leaves Damascus in this kind of extraordinary way through a window to avoid being killed. Um, and it's actually, yeah, there's actually more, more details too. It seems that <clears throat> we're probably talking about now, the calculation is we're talking about the year 39 AD when Paul leaves Damascus and goes to, so his conversion therefore, depending on how we calculate these three years is something like 36, 37 AD. Um, sometime in 39 AD, he goes to Jerusalem, <clears throat> which is being described here. And um, so interestingly, the city of Damascus was actually ruled by the Nabataeans um, and the Nabataeans had been given control uh, in like 37 AD, uh, the Nabataeans had this, this kingdom, which in what is now basically Jordan and Petra, uh, which I got, the, have you guys ever heard of the city of Petra in Jordan? It's this city that's basically inside this valley uh, and it's carved in to this soft rock. Uh, it's incredible. I was yeah, like, I've been I've been there several times, Father, but well, I didn't know that the Nabataeans at one time had control of Damascus. Yeah, so it's actually Caligula uh, in 30, the Roman Emperor Caligula in 37 AD, after Tiberius died, gave control of Damascus to the Nabataeans. <clears throat> so that name will come up later. Um, and so the king, Aretas, uh, we learn about this when Paul's later in chapter 20 or so uh, of Acts, Paul's retelling the story and he mentions King Aretas, who is the Nabataean king. Uh, who probably had assigned some kind of chieftain to oversee Damascus because it was on a, an important trade route and there were a lot of Nabataean merchants in Damascus. <clears throat> so anyway, there's a conflict there because in Paul's account to the Corinthians, he seems to, Paul puts the blame on the, on Aretas, this, the, on the Nabataeans, whereas here Luke says it's the Jews who, who 
got him out of the city. And so some people will try to say, oh, well, look, they're, they're disagreeing again. But actually, they're not really mutually exclusive because <clears throat> the, the Jews probably wouldn't have had any power, per se, in Damascus, but they could have used their influence to go to the Nabataean ruler and accuse Paul of stirring up problems, etc., and get him to act. So it's not actually mutually exclusive. All right. Um, so 26, and when Paul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Sounds natural, right? <clears throat> but Barnabas, now Barnabas, remember the name, remember Barnabas uh, from back in chapter, end of chapter four, I think. <laughs> he was the example uh, right before Ananias and Sapphira where uh, Barnabas was from a Jew from Cyprus. He sold some land and he gave 100% of the proceeds to the church and laid them at the feet of Peter. <clears throat> Barnabas is later in Acts accounted as one of the prophets. So Barnabas took him and, and Barnabas means uh, son, either it can be interpreted two ways. It either means son of encouragement or son of consolation. <clears throat> and so he actually, he kind of fills that role here because Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them, Barnabas declared to them, the apostles, how he, Paul, had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So in other words, Barnabas, who's this figure who's respected and known by the apostles in Jerusalem, vouches for Paul. <clears throat> 28. So he was with them. So he, Paul, was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Coming in and going out is this Hebrew phrase. Uh, it's also used by Luke uh, of Jesus. It means coming in and going out means being at ease, being at home. You came and you, you come and go freely, <clears throat> right? It means you enjoy this uh, familiarity, communion. You're, you're accepted. Um, so apparently Barnabas's intercession works here. And based on Barnabas's word, they accept Paul. 29. And he, Paul, spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. So spoke boldly, the Greek word is parisia. Parisia is this important Greek word, meaning to speak boldly, openly, um, Having parisia, you know, if you look at the lives of the saints, it will often talk about the, the saints having parisia with the Lord. Uh, the mother of God, above all, has parisia with, with her son. It means this uh, freedom to speak honestly and directly, right? So normally, uh, especially in the ancient world, we have a very egalitarian society now where it's harder for us to understand these things, but it was a very hierarchical society then. And you didn't just come up to, to the king and just start spouting off whatever was on the top of your head, right? <clears throat> you had to address him in a certain way. Uh, and you couldn't always just say directly what you thought. Um, so it was only the king's kind of friends who he would give that boldness to, right? It was a sign of intimacy and friendship and equality uh, that the king or whoever was in a higher position would allow someone to speak freely and openly to him <clears throat> so um it's it's something that's in the scriptures here it's something that's praised continually uh he spoke boldly freely directly in the name of the lord jesus so in other words not politically correct <laughs> right he um he would say things uh that were likely to take people off uh, about who the messiah was and how to interpret the old testament so he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. Now, remember, the Hellenists are the group that Paul was the leader or at least representative of, these Hellenistic Jews. So not, not Greeks. They're Hellenized Jews who probably were raised uh, as Jews outside of Jerusalem and then had, for whatever reasons, moved back to to their ancestral homeland in Israel, but they kind of set up their own synagogues where they spoke their native language Greek <laughs> and read the scriptures in Greek. Um, we use the example of uh, kind of like Greek Americans. So these kind of uh, people living in the diaspora. Um, and so, but in this case, it would be like, you know, Greek Americans who then went back to Greece. There would still be, there would be a lot of similarities, but there would still be there some, some differences, cultural differences, even though they share this common Greek identity. 
So in this case here, they share this common Jewish identity, but their native language is still Greek. And so you know, Greek Americans who went back to live in Greece, their native language would still be English. And so, you know, I think I told you a case of my friend who's a priest in Cyprus who had a parish that was in English and it was for these Cypriot, um, Cypriots who were born and raised in England and moved back to Cyprus, <clears throat> something like that. Um, and that these Hellenists, these Hellenized Jews actually tended to be uh, in some ways very conservative. And so they were the most opposed to Paul, to the Christians introducing these new ideas. Uh, they were the ones who disputed against Stephen and end up being the ones who killed Stephen. Now, ironically, Paul, who was their leader, uh, and who led the charge against Stephen and his death ends up coming back and continuing Stephen's role. So when Stephen dies uh, arguing against them, Paul is the one who is most responsible perhaps for his death, but ends up coming back to be the new Stephen. <clears throat> so, and what did they do? But they attempted to kill him. Not surprising. 30, when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. All right, so let me show you the map here. Uh, da, da, da. To Tarsus. Yeah, here we go. All right, so to Caesarea. So here, Damascus. All right, this, is, this map is suggesting the, the identification of where Arabia was, <laughs> like I mentioned, is another big question that we... We can't determine here, uh, but this whole section here, all the way down to Sinai was considered Arabia. So this is conjecturing that Paul was in Damascus. He went out to Arabia at some point, according to the first chapter of Galatians, he returns to Damascus. Then he's let down through the window and goes down to Jerusalem. Then they send him on now to, when the, the Hellenistic Jews try to kill him, they send him up to Caesarea, which was a major port. <clears throat> And they sent him on his way to Tarsus. Now, this is where he was from. So this is modern day Turkey here, Cyprus. So they send him on his way back to Tarsus to get him out of harm's way so that he doesn't end up getting killed. <clears throat> All right. Makes sense. You follow me. And then now the, the story turns. So we've, and, and now the story turns to Peter. And so Luke is very kind of, um, deliberate and, and ingenious in the way that he he tells this story and he, he takes all these sources that he had and he must have had many dozens of sources and he uh, puts them together in a way that makes sense <clears throat> so he introduces Paul now he's going to flash over to Peter and he's developing these two these twin pillars of the church and uh, in their mission <clears throat> this is a kind of summary statement here 31, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So I mean, it's a little bit ironic that, you know, as soon as Paul leaves, there's peace. Um, and this is kind of a, a pattern. Wherever Paul goes, he tends, to, uh, he tends to stir things up because of his bold speech. All right, now it's going to turn to Peter, 32. Now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. <clears throat> all right, so I'll go back to the map here. So here's Jerusalem, here's Lydda. It's uh, Lydda is the Greek word for Lod in the Old Testament. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly big city and this area here is called the Plain of Sharon. Uh, it's probably the biggest city in this plain here before you get into a, a mountain ridge here. Uh, that's probably why this, this, this path here is zigzag because it's going through a mountainous area. And it's about, from Jerusalem to Lydda, it's about 25 miles or so. And from Lydda to Joppa, it's about 12 miles. All right. So, so you can imagine... What's Peter doing? It sounds like Peter's kind of having this almost tour through the area. Now, you remember uh, back in chapter eight, Philip goes, he preaches in Samaria, and then Peter and John come to kind of confirm his work, to lay hands on the people and give them the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> One could guess that something similar is happening now, that that Peter is uh, continuing to travel throughout this area. We're going to see Luke just assumes that there are, um, 
he doesn't even explain how it came to be, but he reports, as we'll see, that there are these pockets of Christians, these Christian communities forming. Probably, we can assume, as a result of the persecution after Stephen. Now, now two, three years have passed, and the, the fleeing of especially the Hellenistic Jews <clears throat> out of Jerusalem because of this uh, persecution, Hellenistic Jews who believed in Christ, they start settling outside Jerusalem and forming some communities. And Peter is going around confirming the people there who are becoming Christians. <clears throat> so just as uh, there's Episcopal oversight in the church to this day, its foundation comes from there. So Peter's traveling through, and he comes to Lydda. There, 33, there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. So this Aeneas, uh, it's a very interesting name. It's, it is a, a Greek or Roman name. It is not a Jewish name. Uh, and in fact, it's an important name <laughs> with historical significance. Aeneas is this figure in Homer's Iliad. And uh, starting with um, the reign of Augustus Caesar, so not long before the time of Christ, so maybe 30 BC, uh, you have Augustus Caesar coming to power and the, the, the poet Virgil and Augustus Caesar, he, he starts to influence the writing of Roman history. And they start to, let's say, tweak Roman history to show that Caesar Augustus is the kind of culmination of this glorious Roman history. Now, Aeneas, interestingly, and this is, this is before BC, and this is 30 BC or so, Virgil writes this story called the Aeneids. Have you guys ever heard this name, the Aeneids? Yes. It's yes. A famous, um, it's, a, it's a myth, it's a mythological history um, that traces, it's kind of the sequel to the Iliad, and the Iliad is probably the, the greatest story of the ancient world, especially the ancient western world, written, you know, 800 BC or something like that, now this is 800 years later, but Virgil takes up to write this sequel, <clears throat> and it follows this character from the Iliad called Aeneas, and basically traces him as one of the founders of Rome. And so the name Aeneas is a really interesting, uh, it's really interesting that this man happens to be named Aeneas because it kind of symbolizes Rome uh, under Caesar Augustus, the modern, the contemporary Roman citizen. So you, you may see some, some people may see some symbolic significance in this uh, idea of raising uh, uh, helping curing this paralyzed lame Roman um, at a time that some would argue that the Roman Empire was kind of entering into this decadence, you know, it was at this, the, the Roman Empire was, was at a height of power and like empires are wont to do, once they reach this height of power, they start with a moral decline. Um, and so some see a commentary here on, on Rome itself <laughs> and that Christianity would come and raise up this lame, paralyzed Rome. But uh, anyway, Aeneas certainly with a name like that is not a, uh, a Jewish uh, name. So he is probably a Hellenistic Jewish Christian uh, who was persecuted, uh, fled, and ends up in this community in Lydda about 25 miles outside Jerusalem. Now he's bedridden eight years and paralyzed. And at that time, you know, there's any number of ways that he could have become paralyzed, but <clears throat> no matter how it happened, there was really no treatment for him except to what they would have done in that time is massage the person with olive oil. That was really the only kind of treatment uh, they had. So there was really no hope that he would get better. 34. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. Now, I'll just say <clears throat> this, arise and make your bed. I, there's some commentary on that. I, I think it's a very strange translation. So the, the, the Greek says, is the Greek verb is uh, stronimi, which means stroson. It says in Greek, I think, yeah, yeah. stroson se afto. So literally, oh, here it is, stroson se afto. Uh, literally means lay out for yourself, <clears throat> lay out for yourself. Now, what does that mean? It could mean, in, in Greek, it's, it can mean to, to spread out, lay out, spread out. So it can mean spread out like a sheet or a blanket to make your bed. It can mean that. Or it's the same word even used to this day in modern Greek when you talk about setting the table to eat. 
you you lay out a, a um, what do you call it a um, in English a tablecloth. You spread out this tablecloth over the table and you set the table. <clears throat> so uh, it could mean make your bed, uh, or it could mean set a table uh, and eat. And to me, that makes so much more sense that this would be uh, set set a table, eat. Uh, because you see this pattern again and again, this, what is in, in Jesus's uh, healings as well. He tells them, okay, arise, eat something, give her something to eat. Paul, Ananias comes, uh, raises him up, he eats. Um, to say ar arise and make your bed is kind of strange, although Jesus does say uh, arise and take up your bed. <clears throat> so it could be an allusion to that, but in any event, it's following this what, what Peter is doing here is a miracle based on the work of Christ. So like it told us in the beginning of Acts, what's happening here is that Christ's church, his, his representatives, the apostles are continuing the work that Jesus began to do, what Jesus began to do and teach. So Peter is the continuation of the work of Christ, just as we see the church to this day. It's the body of Christ continuing to teach and heal and work in history as Christ himself. So he arose, Ananias arose immediately. 35, so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon, uh, that plain of Sharon, saw him, saw Aeneas raised and turned to the Lord. So just like in the gospel, these miracles uh, serve a purpose that people come to believe. <clears throat> all right, 36. At Joppa, all right, now remember, look over here. So here's Lydda. Joppa is about 12 miles away. And this is going to be important for a reason. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple. Now, this interesting disciple, it's the only time in the whole New Testament that th this particular word is used, which is mathitria, mathitria, which means a woman disciple. Uh, it's used uh, in ancient Greek literature to describe two disciples of Plato who happened to be women. Um, but so she is a mathitis is the male version with the 12 disciples look hard. She's a mathitria, a disciple or student. Um, so again, this points to in the ancient world, it was not, uh, it was not unheard of, but it was rare and uncommon in both Greek circles and especially Jewish circles to have women <laughs> disciples. So again, this Luke, uh, above all other New Testament writers, I think, really gives us a window into the important role that women played in the early Christian community, which would have been a scandal, actually. So there's no reason, he had no incentive whatsoever to make that up. <laughs> he would have, Father, what, what, excuse me, what about St. Pecle? She was a disciple of Paul uh, and also he preached later on, St. Yeah, Pecle. But yeah, it's the word doesn't occur in the New Testament, though. But yeah, there are other... Uh, women figures, yeah. But Thecla's story is mainly told in tradition rather than um, in the Bible and the actual scriptures. All right, so at Joppa, so it's on the sea coast, about 12 miles away, there was a certain uh, woman disciple named Tabitha or Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. So Tabitha Tabitha is an Aramaic term. It's translating, um, it's to the Hebrew is. I think Zebi or Zebaya, which is the 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 mother. It's a name I think in um, I think it's in First Kings. It's the mother of the of Joash, who was who was king. So anyway, and it means uh, so you have Zebi, Zebaya, Hebrew, Tabitha, Aramaic, Dorcas in Greek. It all means the same thing. It means gazelle. <clears throat> the word gazelle. Now interestingly. Uh, in the uh, Old Testament, besides that name, you don't really see it except for the most notable place where it appears is in the Song of Songs, where, you know, Song of Songs is this image, beautiful poem uh, imagining uh, the beloved. Now, the beloved really stands for our desire to unite with, with God, who is our beloved. Um, and God's desire for us. <laughs> but this figure of the gazelle is used in the Song of Songs as this kind of beautiful creature, as this figure of the beloved. And so that's what the, the name means here, Dorcas or Tabitha. Um, <clears throat> so, and it says, so there was a certain woman disciple named Tabitha or Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. 
And it's interesting how how the scriptures praise this praise this disciple of the Lord. Um, it doesn't say anything about her teaching or anything like that. Her good works and charitable deeds she's praised for. 37. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, so this was according to the Jewish tradition, which the Christian church takes over and continues to this day, um, you know, especially in Greece, we see to this day that, you know, funerals typically happen within one day. Uh, the body is taken not by some funeral home uh, that's paid to do this and stuff them full of chemicals, but rather it's taken by certain uh, people in the community of faith and the, the, the body is carefully washed. <clears throat> It's also anointed, uh, and then that's laid. It says here, and they laid her in an upper room. So this was the Jewish tradition. It's still a Jewish tradition. It's our Orthodox Christian tradition to this day, that uh, it would be laid out, it would be washed, cleaned, and all this would happen very quickly because it's typically all within one day, <clears throat> within 24 hours. So it might include a night, depending on when they died. And be laid out in the home and this is the origin of the wake you know, that people would come and pay their respects and i in greece i saw people laid out on their dining room table i mean so can imagine your house imagine your dining room table that your loved one would be laid out there and that is completely normal that would be the tradition um so there you have this upper room <clears throat> where they would be laid out um and we see this also in um, Second Kings, you know, the 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 widow of Sarepta, um, uh, she lays her son out in the upper room. Elijah comes, he prostrates himself seven times on the corpse and is, rises again. <clears throat> so the same kind of scene is being evoked here. So they they lay they follow the customs, they lay her out. <laughs> they put her in the upper room. 38. And since Lydda was near Joppa, 12 miles, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there in Lydda, they sent two men to him from Joppa, the coast, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Because why? Why not delay? Because they have 24 hours to bury this body. That's why. And they're asking him, imploring him, come quickly. And so about this 11 or 12 miles distance could probably be covered in about four hours. So it, it's important because it makes it possible that Peter actually could, if he left right away, he could make it in time to see before this 24 hours had elapsed. <clears throat> and so it says, indeed, 39, then Peter rose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. So it said that she was known for her good deeds, her charitable deeds. So it seems that she actually, one of her ministries was to make clothing for the widows, and the widows are always, from Old Testament time, the special class um, that the it's called upon to take special care of the widows. You know, it's not like our day where, where we've built in institutional kind of safeguards uh, to protect women that they might, uh, I don't know, carry, and this is probably from more from a generation ago, but you know, where they would take over their husband's pension plan, et cetera. <clears throat> that, that didn't exist in this time. So it really fell in the religious communities and the Old Testament makes a big deal about caring for widows. So it seems that what Dorcas had, did, had done was that she made clothing and gave it to these poor widows. And so here are these widows actually wearing the garments that Dorcas had made for them uh, as they weep for her and lament her uh, in this kind of wake. <clears throat> 40 but peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed so remember jesus again evoking jesus's um style and peter was with jesus he knew how the lord worked and he's imitating the lord he's carrying on his work peter put them all out he knelt down and prayed and turning to the body he said tabitha arise now interesting here that remember what jesus says to the little girl talitha arise it was in aramaic talitha means little girl tabitha is this name that means gazelle so again we're seeing this parallelism with the work of jesus being continued with peter tabitha arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw peter she sat up then he gave her his hand and lifted her up again this word anistame to to raise up which is the exact word of the resurrection to raise her up to be resurrected 
uh, when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And not only was she alive, she, like Paul, saw she had died she had died and was risen again. She was already participating in some way in the Christian hope of the resurrection. <clears throat> and it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed on the Lord. So again, another miracle, just like in Lydda, uh, someone is raised, raised from uh, paralysis, long-term paralysis, raised from the dead, just like Jesus did. And in both cases, these extraordinary miracles aren't just for show, but uh, have a purpose and lead to people converting. <clears throat> so 43, the last verse of this chapter. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. So a tanner was uh, someone who treated hides. And typically in the ancient world, the way you did that was a lot of times through urine <laughs> actually was a key ingredient. But in, in any event, it was a very, um, mm, what's the word, <laughs> odorous, profession and so it's not surprising that it's at Joppa which is on the sea <clears throat> so probably he would have lived a little bit outside where everyone else lived probably lived close to the water so he had to have access for water for constant cleansing um, but it's considered an unclean profession by the rabbis and that's going to be kind of important rolling into chapter 10 this idea of uncleanness <clears throat> so Peter stays with this guy who the rabbis would have considered uh, unclean because of the nature of his profession. All right, so that concludes chapter nine. Any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> Not your son, you're too much information. No, no, Talita Kumi uh, is what the, you said about Jesus when he raised the little girl, right? Yeah. That's the Talita and this is Tabita or um, oh, Tabitha here, um, and that that is an Aramaic name, right? Tabitha, yeah, or Tabitha, Tabitha, really, it's in Arabic, it's Tabitha. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, just wanted to clarify Talitha versus Tabitha, yeah, and Talitha means to... little girl, right? But yeah. Tabitha is an actual name, yeah, but it all and it also means gazelle, gazelle. But there's yeah. definitely a word play <laughs> going on here. Some people see also a word play. Um, when, when Peter says, um, uh, be healed, uh, or where does he say, where does it he, be healed? The Lord Jesus in the name of the Lord. Oh, here he Jesus says, Christ heals you. Jesus, the Christ heals you. It's actually in, in, um, in Greek, it's Iete Jesus Christos. Iete se Jesus Christos. So it kind of has this Iete Jesus the names, the name Jesus is kind of close and sound to the word for healing. And, uh, you know, Greek, Greek is like that. It's a very, uh, it's interested in, in how it sounds. Uh, so some people see a kind of wordplay going on there. <clears throat> Father, I'm confused about. Oh, are you dry? I, you're unmuted. I think you were unmuted and. Try again. How about this? Is that yeah. better? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dorcas is what language? Greek. Okay. And do both Dorcas and Tabitha mean gazelle? Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, it's the same person. So her name is Tabitha in Aramaic or Dorcas in Greek. So, but it's referring to the same person. That's So it's like, you know, we try to do that too um, sometimes when maybe a convert uh, comes to orthodoxy and has uh, a name that maybe doesn't have immediately a saint attached to it. We'll actually, we'll try to go find a cognate. So what does your name mean in whatever the language is <clears throat> uh, in old English or German? And what's the cognate in Greek? And then usually there's a saint who has that name. And so they'll take that name. Father, you know, the idea, the concept of the upper room up till today in the villages and towns of Palestine, if this village doesn't have a major center where people gather, there's always an upper room still where they all get together if there's a big event. Mm -hmm. In Ramallah, we had an upper room, you know, like, and every clan had its own upper room, you know, like the Abraham clan had their upper room. And, and uh, so it's, it's a concept that continues in the Holy Land. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it was usually the the upper room was usually you know they were they were block kind of one story houses, but the upper room was on the roof. A lot of people uh, there would be a ladder going to the roof, and then you could build an if you had some money you could build a kind of upper room, a second floor <clears throat> uh, on the roof. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, so Father. We'll start Thanks, Father. chapter 10 next week. It's a lot of good information, Father. I'm so glad. Thank you, Father. Good to see everybody. God bless you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye.